Let's pray. Father, you've given to us the revelations of yourself in this book we know as the Bible. It is more precious than any book that has ever been. It is more important to life than any writing ever. And now we have the privilege of opening it, and reading it, and sharing it. As we do, we claim the promise that it will reach to the innermost parts of our being. And there to reveal to us not only who you are, but what you desire of us, what's in our life that should not be and what is not there that should be. And that's our desire in this place today. And bless what we read as we continue to worship you, as we pray in your son's name. Amen. Perhaps you've known one of those folks who just seem to have an internal GPS. You know, they just have this sense of direction. It doesn't matter where they are. They are able to find their way out or to where they want to be. Marsh and I were, lived in the mountains for many years, and we encountered some of those folks who, who could walk the trails and go out into the wooded areas, and they just always found their way out and knew exactly where they were. Maybe you even know folks who don't have that, like me, those who can get lost in a closet. I mean, I do good on the highways and the roads, but you put me out on the woods and the trails, and it's big trouble. Marsha and I were part of the search and rescue in Colorado for several years, and as we went along, they said, looked at me and said, you know, we think you'd be good on the radio. <laughs> and so uh, I became the radio person. But, you know, people get lost in a lot of ways. We get lost physically and geographically when we, we get twisted around and don't really know where we are. Emotionally, we get lost, and our emotions kind of get out of whack, and we feel lost. But most importantly, we get lost spiritually. Uh, not only in the sense of being estranged from God and separated from God by our sinfulness, but, but we get distant from God, and and we're just kind of out there, and, and really the, our heart's desire is to, to go home and to be with him, and the question is, how do we do that? And we're going to share about that today, and we're going to do so from the book of Malachi. If you've got your Bibles, I hope you do. Uh, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And we're going to share from the third chapter of Malachi, if you want to go ahead and turn to that passage. And I'm going to begin reading in Malachi chapter 3 at verse 7. And as I do, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'd like to read all of our focal passage, and then we'll go back and walk through it. God sends these words to Malachi through the Holy Spirit. He says this, Will a man, well, yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. Pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. You can be seated. This is a passage that probably is familiar to a lot of folks, particularly verses 8 through 10, because it's a passage that we often go to as we share about giving and tithing. And, and I'm going to do that today, but, but listen up, folks. The passage that we read today has a, a much greater lesson than just giving and tithing. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I think the lesson of this passage is, and it's faith and obedience. You see, tithing and giving are just evidence of faith and obedience. 
And not in and of themselves the entirety of what God shares here, nor in and of themselves the entirety of what he wants us to know. But when we look at what's in Malachi 3, and particularly the context or setting of it, we understand better this lesson that God's giving us. And so let's do that. And, and the question we begin with is, is why return? If you look back again at verse 7, it says, Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? I see, God starts this passage and what we share today. He says, yet from the days of your fathers, you've gone away from me. And, and for when you and I read that, we probably think of our biological father, even our grandfather. But in our day-to-day, -day, most of the times we don't go past that. I mean, we may know who our great-grandfather is, and those who are into genealogy may go back, but generally, we think of the two generations. But that was not the message that God is sending to the people that read this first. You see, to them, it went much, much, much farther back. In fact, the first references to fathers in Scripture is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when it talks about the judges who turned from obeying God to worshiping Canaanite gods, it called them the fathers. Isaiah talked about it and talked about the iniquities that were placed on his people because of their sins and the sins of their fathers. And Jeremiah talked about it. Let me share these verses with you from Jeremiah 7, verses 25 and 26. Jeremiah wrote, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. And he says, what's happened here is that you've gone away from that which was and that which was obeyed in previous generations. And the setting that God is speaking here is that his people have been sinful and rebellious against him. And this isn't some casual lesson that God is sending their way. It's another instance in which he said, you have failed me, however, I'll come back to you. And you see, they didn't really grasp that because they looked around and, and they probably understood, well, you know, we're not as blessed now as we may have been back here. So the blessings have lessened, but they really didn't understand that God's manifest presence was not all around them. And, and, and in their hearts, they were yearning for that, but they couldn't really define it or put their hands around what it was. And, and their eyes were blinded to the absence of God. They said, well, you know, it's kind of business as usual. We've had better days, but that's okay. And here's a question. God says, you know, I'll return to you if you return to me. And so they heard that and they said, okay, how do we return to you? He said, in what way shall we return? How do we do that? God said, you've been disobedient. You need to repent. And so they say, okay, how? And see, when we talk about repentance, we talk about turning away from what is contrary to God and stopping doing those things that are ungodly, inappropriate, things that God tells us not to do. And that's the beginning of repentance, is when you cease to do those things. Understand this, folks, that's not the end of repentance. Repentance is turning from what you shouldn't be doing to what God wants you to do. You don't just say, okay, I'm going to quit doing that. You say, I'm going to stop this, and I'm now going to be doing what God commands me to do, expects me to do, and desires me to do. And, and when we read this passage, often we, we kind of carve out verses 8 to 10 as the call to tithing. And it is. But before I even get to that, don't miss this. The question was, what do we need to do to repent? That's the predicate before he ever says anything about giving or anything else. The question was, what do we need to do to return to you? In that setting, God answers in verses 8 through 10. Look at them. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. 
But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let me tell you, I've, I've read that passage so many times. Every single time I read it, let me tell you what grabs me. You have robbed me. I, I thought back to the days I was a district judge for a lot of years, and last five years of that I was a pastor. And uh, a few times I had defendants that came into court that had burglarized or vandalized the church. And when i go into court and I was sitting on the bench, over to my right against the wall was this bench and they would bring the inmates in who had cases or things coming up, and they'd sit across there. And I knew most of them. A lot of them were trustees, and we got to be friends and so forth. But they'd sit across that bench, and here would come a defendant up to the front, and the clerk would stand up, and they'd read the charge, and, and they'd say, you know, you're charged with burglary of such and such church. And I'd look over, and them guys on the bench, the inmates, were punching each other in the side and laughing. And they were saying, I wonder if he knows that guy's a pastor. You know, <laughs> let me tell you something, folks. That's nothing, nothing. Can you imagine standing before God himself and he looks into our eyes and he says, you have robbed me. You have taken from me. And, and we can't overlook that. We can't dismiss that. And he says, the way that you have robbed me is not giving back to me a portion of what I gave to you. You know, historically, tithing just referred to giving one-tenth of your produce or what you had. And then in the, the Old Testament, it becomes giving one-tenth of your produce or your income or whatever to the Lord. And, and underlying that was an all-important principle that God owns everything. Now, listen carefully to me, friend. If we don't get that God owns everything... For the rest of your life, when you give to the Lord, you're going to think you're loaning him money or giving him something out of your pocket. You, we have to understand God created everything and owned everything. If we don't, we'll never get tithing. And in the Old Testament, repeatedly it comes to that and shares that the foundation of giving to the Lord is an understanding that he's the one who owns it and gave it to us. And when you get to the New Testament, there's only eight instances in which the word tithing is used, and every time it refers to the Old Testament practice. From which all those theological wizards out there say, therefore, we don't have to tithe. Wrong. In fact, the New Testament principle is that the tithe is just the beginning. The widow who gave two little coins gave everything that she had. And got commended for it. And the principle you see from Jesus is that we respond to the needs that are put before us regardless of any computation that says, oh, I've already hit 10%, I'm not going to do anything. But these verses in Malachi are not just a lesson that says give 10% to the church. And the question we'll walk out of here is not, is that gross or net? That's not the question, that's not the issue. The issue is faith and obedience. If you don't get faith and obedience and we don't get faith and obedience, we don't even need to talk about tithing because that is the predicate to it. And rest assured of this, God's not sitting in some counting room up there going, oh, Doug short. <laughs> he don't need my money. He's God. And by the way, so you know, there's no purses or wallets in heaven, Okay. That's not the issue up there with God. The issue is my faith and my dependence on God. This is a matter of intimacy with God. And we don't tithe and give because a financial statement says you're ahead of the budget or behind the budget. That's just a reminder. We give because we believe in God. He owns everything and he says return a portion. And the giving supports the ministry of the church. But more importantly, our giving reflects our faith and obedience 
to God. Now some may say, can, can, I, can I have an eternity that is secure and not tied? Yes, you can. The important question that follows is that, can I be a person of true faith and obedience and not tithe? And the answer is no. And God reinforces the importance of our giving to him in this passage. Look at verse 10 again. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now let's break it down a little bit. Look at the first part of verse 8. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This is the storehouse. The church is the storehouse. It's where we work, we learn, we grow, we give. And we give here to support the ministries and missions of God's church so that it brings him glory. Then he says this, And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The only place in the Bible where God says, Test me. Try me on this. Can you believe that? You think it's important to God? He says, just put it out there in front of me and find out what happens. And then he says this. Not only does he say, I own it, return it to me, I placed it in your care, but he says, if you'll give it back to me, I will give more to you than you gave to me. That's incredible. No, 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 that's not. That's grace. God owns everything. He says, here, I'm going to put it in your care. I'm going to let you take care of it. I'm going to entrust it to you. Here's 100%. Okay, tell you what. Give me 10% back in tithing. Oh, by the way, I'm going to give you more than you gave me. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to. It's God. But understand this. If you think you're going to give God $10 out of 100 and get a $20 bill back, you can forget it. Those out there that want to tell you that your bank account's going to explode, it's not going to be because of that. But I want to ask you something. If you gave him $10 and he gave you $20 back, or you could have peace and security and joy and love and all of these other things that God offers, what are you going to pick? That $20 will be gone before you know it. But the peace and the joy and the love and the grace, all of those are a constant part of life. God says, I'll bless you so much because of your faith and obedience, not just because you tithe. And you have to understand this, folks. We don't tithe for what we get. We tithe because it shows our dependence upon God. And even though all this doesn't make a lot of sense in our rational thoughts, that's okay. You know what God said in Isaiah 55? Let me paraphrase it for you. It'll be on the screen. Here's my version. I don't think like you, and I don't act like you. He is so far above us that his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. By the way, I'm glad. But God says, I'll bless you. You see, the people of Judah looked to God and they said, God, how can we return to you? And implicit in that question was this, how can we feel your presence again? How can we really know that you're among us? And God said, obey my commands and show your faith and dependence and you'll know me. And church, this speaks to us today, to every single one of us. It speaks to us individually, it speaks to us collectively, and it speaks to us nationally. And, and I don't want you to ever give a penny because the preacher said so. I don't want you to give a penny because you feel guilty. Listen, we don't live in guilt, we live in grace. But I do want us to be convicted to live a life of faith and obedience to God. And from that comes tithing. This whole year, we've talked about living the cross, showing 
God and Jesus Christ in who we are we do. And that includes our giving. Now look at verses 11 and 12. God says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you'll be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. God said, if you'll be faithful and obedient, I'm going to bless you exactly in the way you need it most. You're going to produce in the fields the food that you need to live. I'll provide for you. You're going to have fruit on the vines that will produce and be what you need. And then he says, people are going to look, nations are going to look and call you blessed. Isn't that incredible? Let me, you know how that works? People are going to look at the people of God and they're going to go, wait a minute. They got fields that are full of crops. They have vineyards that are full of grapes. They are provided for. How did that happen? And it will display God and bring glory to him. That's what this is about. People will know. And he said, I will bless you as a nation. Now, friends, let me be very direct here in application. You know, throughout our country right now, there are thousands upon thousands of believers, Christians, who are lamenting the condition of our country morally, spiritually, and they're correct. I mean, we're moving away from God. But what I continually see is so many believers who point their fingers at non-believers and say, there's the whole cause of our problem right there. It's past time that we recognize we're at fault, too. You know, surveys show, listen up, 2 to 4% of professed Christians tithe. 2 to 4%. Now, let me tell you, a lot of folks read that and they go, oh, wow, we're operating on a 25th to a 50th of what we're supposed to have. That may be the effect. That's not the issue. What that means is 96 to 98% of professed Christians are not being completely faithful and obedient. That's what God's looking at. And that's the state that we find ourselves in. And we wring our hands and say, oh, whoa, why is all this happening? Why isn't it better? They need to do this. They need to change. Folks, we need to address what God says. He's not writing this to non-believers. He's writing it to his people right here. They're the ones who said, how do we get back? He says, I'm going to tell you. You be faithful and you be obedient. And he says, not only am I going to bless you, I'm going to bless you. Your nation. Now I'm going to tell you folks, I've never checked a person's giving record other than staff because I don't serve with non-tithers. And I'm never going to check one. But God knows. And God sees it. And it has no dollar sign on it. It's measured completely in the arena of faith and obedience. He measures that in a multitude of ways that are all found within the pages of the Bible. Today, he addresses it in the passage we share about faith and our giving. But I want to close with a verse familiar to you, but so pertinent, relevant, and important to what we share today. It's Hebrews eleven six. Here's what God said. God says, without faith, it's impossible to please me. But understand this, that I am a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. I don't know of a more direct and important verse in Scripture than that one. God says to us directly, you want to know what's most important to me? And underneath it is this, you want to know why I made you? I made you so that you could exercise faith, show dependence in me, and bring me pleasure and glory. And there's so many ways that we do that. And if you're a believer here today, one of those is how we respond in returning to God part of what he's given to us. But let me tell you something more important. The most important step of faith 
is not found in a check or a wallet or a purse. It's found in the heart. It's when someone says, I am separated from God. There's something missing in there that I can't find. And the Holy Spirit touches and says, let me show you where it is. You see, in creating us to display that faith, God said, the way that you're going to come back to me and be mine is through that faith. God in his incredible power, wisdom, presence could have given every single one of us a DVD with Jesus coming out of the tomb. But he said it wouldn't be faith. It'd be sight. So he says, you've got to look into your heart and there lay claim and conviction to a love so great that it would do the unimaginable and take a perfect only son and give him up for you. And he says, what I want from you is that conviction in the heart. And what I want from you is a life that yields to him. And friends, when we have this invitation, it is only evidence of what's already happened in the heart. There's no journey from where you sit to the front of this church that's going to change your life. This is a public profession of your faith and obedience. But it all begins right there. It's examined there, convicted there, accepted there. We're going to have that invitation now. You bow with me as I pray.